Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Hope Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Ben Gonzalez, and if you haven't uh, had a chance to meet me or missed me uh, last Sunday, Pastor is on uh, vacation, and I believe after this Sunday he will uh, be back, but it's a joy and an honor to come and once again be with the Hope uh, family. Uh, I currently work at the Texas District Office, uh, some wonderful staff there, and again, I bring my greetings from President uh, Mike Newman of the Texas District uh, LCMS office. So again, just a joy uh, to be with you this morning. And before we get into our time of worship, uh, I wanted to see if there were any announcements for the family this morning. Yes, ma'am.
Father, we thank you for life. We thank you for new life. We know that, uh, Father, you are the giver of life. And so we ask that you would bless this new life, bless the family um, as they gather. Um, Lord, we just, we commend this new life to you and ask, Lord, that you. 
you would watch over, protect, bless um, this young, this young new life. Lord, we also thank you uh, today for uh, graduation, not just for uh, Nolan, but for all those that are graduating. And we thank you for this milestone in their life. We thank you that you have brought them this far, and Lord, we know that it's you who will continue to lead, guide, and direct them. And so we, we bless all those uh, who are graduating and, and going to either to college for the first time, uh, maybe even high school the first time. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you would bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Uh, just a quick update. Again, and uh, we thank you that we can hear, uh, Father, that you, fa in fact, do answer prayer. We thank you for the recovery of John. Lord, we ask that your spirit would be with him, that you would continue to bring your healing work and power into his life and remind him, Heavenly Father, that you are with him. And so bless him, Lord, continue to heal him in the name of Jesus. trials and hardship of her body, you remain constant. You remain faithful. You remain true. So, Father, we thank you this morning that your faithfulness is evident in the life of faith. Lord, that the work that you are doing in her, Lord, we know that you will hold to your promise, that you will see it through completion, and we give you the honor and the glory and the praise that you are due in Jesus' name. Amen. Come with thanksgiving for God, O oh Lord, and we just thank you, God, for her. We thank you for her family, Lord. We know that you are at work. We know that your promise is not necessarily that you will pull us out of our problems, but your promise is that you will be with us while we're in there. That is our hope. That is our trust. We are not alone. You never leave us. You never forsake us. And so, Father, today I pray for God, and I just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for the work you will continue to do. We trust you. We place, place it into your hands, Father. And we give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. Yellow. Bless all the teachers here, all those that we know of, all the schools, surrounding schools. And Father, we ask, Lord, that you would give them an extra measure of your spirit, God. Uh, today is so hard and challenging to be in the school system. And so, Father, we ask that you would bless this time that they have off, that you would refresh them, that you would give them strength, Lord, for a new year. Guard them, protect them. Lord, help them 
as they go on vacation or time of need, Lord, that you would uh, be with them and give your spirit to them and remind them that they are sons and daughters, Lord, that you'll guide and protect them. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Excellent, Brian. Don't struggle in your salvation. All right, for Brian. Oh, Father, today we come and we commend Brian to you. Uh, Lord, you know all the details. You know all the struggles. You know all the health issues. And you're the one who's created life. And so, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would... Um, you would show and be present, not just in his mind, in his spirit, but in his body. Uh, Lord, would you come alongside him? Would you lay your healing hands on him? Lord, we ask that you would uh, comfort, give peace. And Lord, ultimately, Lord, we ask that we would trust you. We would trust your ways. We would trust your process. Was it again? My mother. Your mother? Okay. So she's taking a medication? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Father, we pray today, uh, Lord, that as. Um, what is your mother's name again? Father, all these prayers we come into you, even the prayers on our hearts, uh, the prayers that may have gone unspoken today, Lord, uh, you hear us. You hear us, and we are thankful, and we are grateful 
that we serve a God that is not distant, but that is near. And so this morning, Father, we thank you that you have invited us not just to come and worship you for you are worthy, but that we can come and speak to you and hear from you and put these requests before you, before you knowing you are a good, good, good Father. We love you. We give you all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We begin with our opening hymn. our time in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sin, O Lord, who could stand? Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our own heart. We have not loved our neighbors and ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us. mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Christ. 
Merciful guiding, accomplish them. The first reading for the sixth Sunday after Easter comes from Acts chapter six, verses nine through fifteen. A vision of a man from Macedonia came to Paul during the night. He stood urging Paul, come over to Macedonia and help us. Immediately after he saw the vision, we prepared to leave for the province of Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We sailed from Troas, straight from Samothrace, and came to Neapolis the following day. From there, we went to Philippi, a city in Macedonia's first district and a Roman colony. We stayed in that city several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the riverbank 
where we thought there might be a place for prayer. We sat down and began to talk with the women who had gathered. One of those women was Lydia, a gentle God worshiper from the city of Thyatira, a dealer in purple cloth. As she listened, the Lord enabled her to embrace Paul's message. Once she and her husband were baptized, she urged, Now that you have decided that I am a believer in the Lord, come and stay in my house. And she persuaded us. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from Revelation chapter 21, various verses. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues spoke to me. Come, he said, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. He took me in a spirit-inspired trance to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. The city had God's glory. Its brilliance was like a priceless jewel, like jasper that was as clear as crystal. It had a great high wall and twelve gates. By the gates were twelve angels, and on the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel's sons. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. The city wall had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the Lamb's twelve apostles. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was made from a single pearl, and the city's main street was pure gold, as transparent as glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, because God's glory is in its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will, be, will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring the glory. and honor of the nations into it. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is vile and deceitful, but only those who are registered in the Lamb's scroll of life. This is the word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 16th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. O Lord. In that day you will not ask me anything. I assure you that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Up to now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy will be complete. I have been using figures of speech with you. The time's coming when I will no longer speak to you in such analogies. Instead, I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believe that I came from God. I left the Father and came into the world. I tell you again, I am leaving the world and returning to the Father. The disciples said, see, now you speak plainly. You are not using figures of speech. Now we know that you know everything and that and you do not need anyone to ask you. Because of this, we believe you have come from God. Jesus replied, now you believe? Look, a time is coming and it's here 
when each of you will be scattered to your own homes and you will leave me alone. And I'm not really alone, for the Father is with me. I've said these things to you so that you will have peace in me. In the world, you will have distress. But be encouraged. I have conquered the world. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now we confess our faith by using the words of the Nicene Creed. Let us confess together, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. You may be seated as we continue with our next hymn. Father, we thank you this morning that you have gathered your people. Lord, we're reminded this morning that this gathering belongs to you. It's in your name. It's through your power. It's by your spirit that we have been called here. Father, we ask this morning that as 
you have gathered us here that um, your spirit might allow us to have ears that are open, eyes to see. Father, we ask that you would help us to hear you, for you are the good shepherd. Lord, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, may they be pleasing to you. You are our Lord, you are our Redeemer, you are our rock, you are our shelter, you are our fortress. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. If you have a Bible with you, uh, we are going to spend a few moments this morning uh, in Acts chapter 16. Uh, Don't ever trust a preacher when he says a few moments. Um, But just as the Spirit leads this morning, I'd love for us to consider uh, the Spirit and the Gospel. I don't know if you have either heard of, read, or ever watched a very, very popular movie called The Wizard of Oz. I I don't know if I've ever met anybody who has not heard of, uh, read, or either watched uh, The Wizard of Oz. And I don't know if you remember watching it uh, when you were growing up or watching it with the grandkids now, but you remember the scene where Dorothy, the scarecrow, the lion, the tin men, they finally make it to Oz. They finally made it to see the wizard. And as they approach the wizard, there's a huge curtain and a loud, booming voice. They believe they've made it, and this is the wizard. And all of a sudden, you remember little Toto? (laughs) Finds his way and starts to peel back the curtain. And what do they notice? They notice that the wizard is not really much of a wizard of all, uh, at all, right? That, that he's back there pulling levers, <laughs> speaking into a microphone with an, an intimidating voice. And to their shock and their awe, the wizard was not at all what they thought he was. He was simply a man with an intimidating voice pulling levers. It made me wonder this morning how much lever pulling is done in the name of evangelism. Now, I'm I'm not against training and I'm not against encouragement. I'm not against being prepared to give an answer for the hope that is within you. So don't hear me wrong this morning. However, I think one thing that we need to be reminded of today is that real gospel sharing, real gospel effect, real evangelism is first and foremost the work of the Spirit and not the work of man. In fact, I think what can happen when the gospel is driven primarily by man is something that Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians 1. He says when it's based on our speech and our words and our wisdom and our lever pulling and our training, we're actually emptying the cross of its power. Think about that for a moment. In our attempt to make the gospel message effective, it actually has the opposite effect. According to Paul, it becomes an ineffective, and useless. And it should be a terrifying thought that we could empty the cross of its power. See, you cannot call people to the gospel without the cross. And if you can't call people to the gospel without the cross, then you can't call people to the gospel without Jesus. You can't call people to the gospel without Jesus. Then you can't call people to the gospel without the Holy Spirit. And if you cannot call people to the gospel without the Holy Spirit, you cannot call people to the gospel without God the Father. They all go together. So let me summarize it this way. You can't talk about God without God. (laughs) You can't talk about Jesus without Jesus. 
We can't effectively share the gospel without him. Without the work of God, the gospel just becomes the work of man sitting behind a curtain, pulling levers with intimidation tactics that don't really change the heart of people. That's why I think Acts 16 is so important for us. Because listen, the point today is not that we should share the gospel less. (laughs) So hopefully you hear me right. In fact, I think in this hour, one of the greatest needs in the church is not gospel less. It's a people who are not ashamed of the gospel. A people who see themselves as salt, light, witnesses, ambassadors. But there are also people who understand that the effect of the gospel, the power of the gospel, does not reside in man. It resides in God himself. A people who do not have to carry the burden of lever pulling and intimidation and can rest in the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it's important to consider. Think about this. What the most common evidence that a person was filled with the Spirit in the New Testament. What do you think your answer would be of the most common? If you were to do a survey of the New Testament, what would be the most common evidence that a person was actually filled with the Holy Spirit? Think about what your answer might be. It's not the only evidence, but it's the most common evidence of the habitation of the Spirit in a person. Would your answer be that they could heal people? Would it be that they were able to prophesy? That's how you know they were filled by the Spirit. Would it be their ability to cast out demons? Would it be that they spoke in tongues? Would that be the evidence that the Spirit was in them? Interestingly, the most common evidence that someone was filled with the Spirit in the New Testament was that they declared the word of the Lord boldly. That's the most common evidence that someone was filled with the Spirit in the New Testament. Because this is just what the Spirit does. This is what the Spirit loves to do because the Holy Spirit is in love with Jesus. He loves to inhabit and enable people to love and enjoy Jesus. And when they love and enjoy Jesus, they just naturally tend to talk about him. (laughs) No lever pulling, no tactics. Now, I think it's important for us to pull back a couple verses this morning. And instead of starting with verse 9, I think we should start with verse 6 of chapter 16. So if you have a Bible this morning, uh, would you uh, get that out and flip over? If you have a phone, it's okay. It's legal. You can use that. But look at verse 6. I love this. It says, and they. Now, according to the context, we know this is Paul, Silas, and Timothy who joins them. That's the they. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. Now, this is very interesting. Having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. What? I mean, I thought that was the whole point. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. But the spirit of Jesus, I I think you should underline that. The spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. Think about this. The Holy Spirit actually forbade Paul to do something we normally think is a good thing. Preaching God's word to those who need it. That's how much emphasis the gospel is on the work of God. The spirit of God directs the work. And if the spirit can direct someone not to share the gospel, then he most certainly be the one who directs someone who does. And I love that Luke uses the phrase, the spirit of Jesus. It's a phrase that's that's not very common, but we see it. It's It's not just the Holy Spirit. It's very, 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 very clear. It's the Spirit of Jesus. 
see, what did Jesus do when he was here? What was his purpose? <laughs> this is phenomenal. He was the word of God in flesh, and everywhere he went, he proclaimed the word because he was the word. It's not something he did. It's who he was. He was the word of the prophets, the word of the Old Testament, now in flesh. And he's walking around the neighborhood. The word is walking around the neighborhood in flesh. He's proclaiming, not because it's what he does, but because of who he is. Then he dies. He rises. He's ascended. Well, who's going to do the work of Jesus now that sits at the right hand of God? And your answer is probably the disciples. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. I believe the one who does the work that Jesus was doing is not necessarily man. It's man that's filled with the spirit. The spirit of Jesus. But our temptation is to say, it's our work now, so how many levers do we got to pull to bring people in? Instead of realizing it's the work of God, it's the work of the spirit. If there's any work on our part, it's simply this. Lay down your will. Lay down your plan for the direction that the Holy Spirit brings. If you get to do anything at all, it's simply surrender. <laughs> Sounds like fun, right? Verse 9, here we go. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia, help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia. Do you see the language change? See, first it was they, now it's we. It says, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So what happened? See, some commentators believe that in Paul's vision, the man was actually Luke. Now think about how important it is that the Spirit is leading and directing in the work of gospel sharing. Think about how important this is of how God is directing rather than man's lever pulling. They were forbidden by the Spirit to go to Asia. Then the Spirit did not permit them to go to Bithynia. Instead, the Spirit led Paul and his team to go to Troas and pick up a doctor named Luke. <laughs> and so now we have a book called Luke, right? And we have the book of Acts because they listened to the Spirit rather than man's lever pulling. You can say, thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Verse 11, so setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to uh, Neop Neopolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. Verse 13, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. See, the fact that they were at a riverside tells us something. There was no synagogue there. Because it takes 10 men in order to establish a synagogue. And there wasn't a lot of men, but there was a lot of women. Look at verse 14. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. Isn't it interesting that someone can be attracted to the form of worship, but not the object of worship? Isn't it interesting that someone can be attracted to the form of of worship, but not be in love with the object of that worship. That religious practice of worship does not conclude a relationship with Jesus. C. 
see, lever pulling and tactics might get people in a room, but it takes someone else and something else to actually change their heart. Tactics and forms might fill seats, but it takes someone or someone something else to fill hearts. And we should be careful how much we rely on other things. Now, one of the uh, benefits of preaching at different churches is that I get to preach and go home and I don't have to come back. And I can say some things that maybe your pastor can't say. And just so you know, last week they gave me the check. It's already been cashed. You can't take it back. But I, but I say this, and, and I, I want to say this in all respect and, and honoring you. But I think it needs to be said. We should be cautious about doing things in the name of evangelism. Facebook is not evangelism. Instagram is not evangelism. Twitter is not evangelism. Now, those things are marketing, they're not wrong. There's nothing wrong to use them. There's nothing wrong for a church or for Christians to have a Facebook account, a YouTube account, a Twitter account, a Snapchat account. I mean, I've lost count. It's not illegal, but let's call it what it is. It's marketing. It's not evangelism. Well, come on, Ben, aren't you kind of splitting hairs? And, you know, aren't we supposed to to do everything we can to grow the kingdom. I mean, isn't that why we're here? We're here because we're supposed to grow the kingdom. It's all about growing the kingdom. Well, actually, there's no command in the scripture to grow the kingdom. None. Take a look. You can prove me wrong. Email me this week if I'm wrong. There is no command in the scripture to God's people to grow the kingdom. What I have found in the scripture is that the kingdom is only to be received and entered. And the next part of this verse shows us how one receives and enters the kingdom. Not grows the kingdom, but enters into it, receives it, is welcomed into it. Look at the next verse, part of the verse. The Lord opened her heart. Everybody say the Lord. Lord. Come on, one more time. The Lord. The Lord Lord. opened her heart. Not some lever pulling, not some manipulation, not some tactics, not the best social media platform. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to, What was said by Paul, the source of salvation is not man's work. It's God's. He's the one who initiates. Because he's actually doing his job opening hearts. It's not your job. It's not my job. It's not your responsibility to save people. It's not my responsibility to save people. In fact, people don't make very good saviors. (laughs) And this should be a great relief that I don't have to keep trying harder. And I don't have to keep pulling levers. And I don't have to be looking for the next tool and the next mechanism or hoping to find the next silver bullet for growth strategy. I don't have to carry the burden or the guilt when someone in my life has not come to faith yet on my time frame. I don't have to get frustrated when someone in my life, when they're not where I think they should be spiritually. Come on, somebody say amen. (laughs) And if you're frustrated and you're tired, it's because you're taking on a yoke that ain't yours. You're taking on a responsibility that you were never supposed to have. 
It's not our job to grow the kingdom. It's God's. The only responsibility we are called to is when the spirit prompts, say yes. (laughs) Just say yes. You know why the father loved Jesus? Because the brother always said yes. And here's the thing. The reason this must be the work of God, the work of the spirit, is because there's no way you and I in our natural state, in our flesh, can ever make someone understand that they've offended a holy God. That they didn't just make some mistakes, they're actually a sinner in need of a savior. That what they need above all else is to be forgiven. And that through a man named Jesus who was sinless, died, was buried, on the third day rose, ascended to the right hand of God, he's going to come back to judge the living and the dead. And this God is offering forgiveness. And there's nothing in your flesh, there's nothing in my natural flesh that's going to get someone to cause that, cross that line. Here's why. Because only God can raise the dead. Only God can raise the dead. No amount of training, no amount of Bible studies, no amount of curriculum, no amount of outreach events, no amount of tools, social media platforms can do what only God can do. Change the eternal trajectory of a life. So what can we do? We can say yes when the Spirit prompts. Verse 15, and after... She was baptized (laughs) in her whole household as well. It was a two-for-one special. It was awesome. This is how God works, man. Multiplication. Not just Lydia, but her whole family. You mean I don't have to carry the burden of saving my family? I don't have to carry the guilt and burden of a family member who's not where I hope they should be in their faith? Nope. You mean I just simply have to trust God that when the Spirit prompts me, I simply say yes and I obey and let the outcomes up to Him? You mean that's how I'm supposed to live? Yes. And He will do a better job than we ever can because what He starts, He always sees to completion. So what can I do? I can pray, be filled by the Spirit. When the Spirit prompts me, I say yes. I walk in step with the Spirit. I find out where He's he's already at work, and I just join Him. And here's where Luke records evidence of saving faith. She urged us, saying, look at the text. She urged us, saying, if you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Here's how you know this is the work of God. She responded by opening her home the way the Lord opened her heart. Not because the Lord manipulated her. Not because Paul had great gospel tactics and great training. No, the Lord is working in the background to change her heart. And she naturally does what God's already done to her. Wow. Now again, please don't hear me this morning. I don't want to get, you know, pastor in trouble when he comes back. Please don't hear me say this morning that we're not called to share the gospel. I can't say that because the scriptures say differently. In fact, while some of us are actually have been given the gift of evangelism, all of us are still called to share the gospel. In fact, what I do believe is that one of the greatest things needed in this hour is the preaching and the sharing of the gospel, not just because people need to be saved. Of course we want to see people saved and disciples made. Yes and amen. But evangelism, sharing the gospel, both word and deed, is actually one of those things that causes tremendous trust and dependence on the Holy Spirit. If you want to grow in the work of the Spirit in your life. Wait for Him to prompt you and just say yes. 
It's actually what God uses to deepen our trust. And if you have the Holy Spirit, you have everything you need. <laughs> you remember the end of the scene in The Wizard of Oz? The way the wizard actually helps Dorothy, the lion, the scarecrow, and the tin man. Remember what happens? He's exposed. He comes from behind the curtain. And he meets them right where they are. And he speaks words to their deepest need. He speaks words to their deepest longing. That's what we are called to do. Not to pull levers, not to use tactics, but to point to the one who has come from behind the veil, the one who has torn the veil, destroyed the veil, and can speak to and enter into people's deepest longings and needs. This is God's work and his work alone. And it is the Spirit through the person of Christ who actually can speak to a person's deepest longing. Our work, say yes when the Spirit prompts and be ready to give an answer to the hope that is within you. But the work by which we're called to do is not to save, but to trust and point to the one who can. Amen? All right, let's stand for prayer. Father, we come to you as children. We come to Abba, Father. We come as you have called us to. Father, we know that you have called us to be light, to be salt, to be ambassadors, to be witnesses. Father, help us never, ever, ever forget that our only, our only work is to simply step into the work you're already doing. Our only responsibility is to step into the work you are already manifesting. Lord, help us to be relieved this morning of the burden of feeling like we have to save someone, that we have to save our spouse or our children or our coworker or our neighbor. All we simply do is when you prompt us, we say yes, and we obey you and leave the outcome to you. Father, help us to trust you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For hearts eager to pray to our Heavenly Father, for the good of our families, neighbors, rulers, brothers, and sisters in Christ, pastors and overseers, let us pray to the Lord. For the baptized, for hearing hearts, prayful lips, sacrificial lives, that the church of God will be enriched unto the salvation of many, let us pray to the Lord. For our homes, that Christ would give them peace and enliven them with his resurrected life, that he would cause the forgiveness of sins to reign among husbands and wives, parents and children, that we assure those who live alone that they too are his children, upheld in his right hand. Let us pray to the Lord. For the faithful women of the church, that they would eagerly and wisely serve her ministry as faithful Lydia served the mission of St. Paul. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who commune this day, that they would receive our Lord's body and blood and repentance and faith for the forgiveness of sins in the unity of true confession, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trust in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we respond during our time of offering. <laughs>
stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give you thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death, that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and saying... give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name as he taught us. Our Father. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. In the same way also, after he had supped and after he had given thanks, he said, Take and drink. This is my blood of a new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and his return. Amen.
see, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us in the same and faith toward you and in love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace.